my name is John Jackson. I'm the new president of William Jessup University. We've got any WJU fans out there? Okay, great. Hey, we're excited about being here today at Bridgeway Christian Church. If you are here for the very first time, or if you don't have a Bible this morning, we would love to share one with you. The ushers have Bibles they'll bring to you. Just slip your hand up and they'll bring it to you. Uh, we're particularly excited at WJU to partner with you. Uh, we are just over the uh, off-ramp there. Our vision, uh, three quick things. Number one, we want our campus to be a place that thrives spiritually. We have a heart for God, passion for God. Second of all, we want to do quality liberal arts education, uh, help people, uh, teach people how to think, equip them with a world, uh, tools for lifelong learning. And third, we want uh, our students to be exceptionally employable. Uh, parents in the room, we believe that after a season of learning, there should be a lifetime of earning. Anybody in favor of that as parents? Yeah, that'd be a good deal. I bet. There we go. So, hey, we love your church. Uh, so many of our staff and students are a part of Bridgeway. We f- kind of feel like it's extended family and want to thank you for your ministry. Your fruitfulness is known throughout our area. And I particularly like your core values of worship, love, obedience, and hope. Those are very meaningful to me. Let me give you a little of my background, just so you know who's talking to you up here. I was born and raised in church. Uh, Dad and mom pastored small Baptist churches in Southern California. Between the ages of zero and 16, they had a conviction from God that I would be forced to go to church every single Sunday and Wednesday. I went Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday night. I have been to church with mumps, measles, flu, chicken pox, cold, fever, etc. I've been to church with all those things, In fact, sometimes when I tell my story, I say to people, look, I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church every single week. No lie, that's actually my story. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, It's just been great to be a partner with you, but I wanted to just share, because you're in a year of worship, that uh, I have the privilege of sharing with you today from 1 Samuel chapter 28. If you have a Bible, you can turn there, and before you arrive there, or before we start unpacking that, I want to tell you just one more story from my particular background. Uh, I was, uh, we have five children. My wife Pam is here today, somewhere in the audience, uh, I think back out there. Uh, And so she's here. This is her second time hearing the teaching. So uh, we have five children, age uh, 27, 24, 20. Those are all three girls. And for a long time, that meant that I was a dodo, a dad of daughters only. And so, uh, so anyway, for that, I was dad of daughters only. Then we have two boys, 14 and 12. And so that's our kind of life, five kids. And uh, this story occurred when Jennifer, our oldest, now 27, was about four or five years of age. We were going fishing. I was going fishing with my two brothers, and uh, our family is what I would describe as convenience fishermen. Now, you know what this is, right? Uh, As long as there's a a restaurant and other conveniences nearby, we'll be glad to fish. And uh, so we were going fishing on the Truckee River. It was right along the uh, 80. Uh, I think the exit, if I recall, had a McDonald's nearby. And so we went to the McDonald's. We had kind of our stuff. And then we went down the the road uh, where the McDonald's was. We got to the end. There was a little cul-de-sac. And then there was a barrier in front little sign to the right and a dirt road that went past that. And my brothers egged me on. You know how brothers are. They said, well, look, John, we just go past the sign, past the barriers and and go on that road. And uh, now the sign did say no trespassing. But as I calculated a variety of things, uh, legal theory, public policy, a variety of other issues, I came to believe that uh, that sign was really intended for other people. So... So I drove the car, maneuvered around the barrier, went down the dirt road, went about a mile or so, and pulled off and and began uh, to fish. But before I did that, uh, an unfortunate incident occurred. My daughter, Jennifer, age four or five in the back seat, was beginning to get a clue of what was happening with my brothers egging me on, and just do it, John, just do it, doesn't matter what the sign says. And so finally, she said, Daddy, uh, what did that sign mean back there? And so I started to explain to her, but before I could do that, my brothers uh, butted in. You know how brothers are. They butted in and they said, Jennifer, your daddy broke the law. He's a lawbreaker. Your daddy's a bad person. Now I'm watching, I'm listening to it, but I'm watching all this unfold from my rear view mirror and I'm seeing my daughter back there, her cheeks are getting red, her pupils are dilating, and finally she just can't handle it anymore and she said, my daddy's not a bad man, he is not a lawbreaker. Are you dad? (laughs) And that's how it came to be that at age four or five my daughter learned about her father's sin nature and uh, these things do work out. So let me just tell you what I think that story has to do with us today. I've become convinced in over 30 years of pastoral ministry that many of us reach circumstances in our life where we're at the end of the road. We're at the end of the road or we're at the end of the rope. 
regardless of how the circumstances got you there, we get to the end of the road or the end of our rope. And when that happens, it's my observation that you have one of two choices. When you're at the end of the road or end of the rope, you can either lean into God or you can lean away from God. I want to teach us today what God's word says about what we should do when we're at the end of the road or end of our rope. And sometimes the Bible teaches using negative examples. So if you haven't gotten there yet, get to 1 Samuel chapter 28. Pastor Lance gave me the assignment to teach on this chapter. And uh, you'll see today that there's some difficult parts of it. In fact, uh, so much so that I've actually said that he owes me lunch for having to teach on this particular passage. There's some tough stuff in here. But let me give you some context. Uh, Basically, the nation of Israel has chosen a king. His name was Saul. Uh, God did not want Israel to have a king. He wanted uh, to be their only king. But they refused and said, we've got to have a king just like every other nation. So he uh, let them choose a king. They chose Saul. And Saul had been disobedient. Sometimes the disobedience was minor, but other times pretty major stuff. He actually went against the will of God. He tried to assume the role of the priest. He stepped outside his kingly assignment. And uh, God had actually proclaimed judgment on him. He had used his prophet, Samuel, and said, Saul, your kingdom's going to be taken away from you. In fact, so much so that God had actually told Samuel to go and anoint the next king. He anointed David. Some of you are familiar with that story. I suspect that news had gotten out to Saul, that he knew David was going to be his successor, that David had already been anointed as the next king. Saul invites David into the palace. He says, David, would you come into the palace, play your electric guitar, actually it's probably a harp, but play your harp and uh, soothe me with your music, it'll be great. So one day David is playing his harp in the palace. Saul is seized by a demonic spirit. He takes a spear and he hurls it at David. David narrowly escapes with his life. He's on the run. He leaves the palace. He ends up having to be in hiding. Israel arranges all the military forces they can. They've got the FBI, the CIA, the special ops of that day, chasing after David and about 400 guys. Now, these 400 guys are miscreants and malcontents. They're the ruffians uh, of the day. And, And so David is literally trying to go get away from the armies of Israel. They're hiding out in caves. Eventually, they get to this point. They said, look, we, there's no safe place in Israel. We've got to hide. Let's hide in the land of the Philistines. In chapters 29, 30, and 31, which you'll hear about starting next week, uh, David has to grapple with the issue of, will he go to war against Saul and his own people? That's kind of the pressure he's under living in the land of the Philistines. But today's chapter uh, begins with this context. Uh, David is in the land of the Philistines. Saul is pursuing him. And the Philistine nation is going to come to war against the nation of Israel. Let's pick up the story in verse 3. 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. Here's what we read in that context. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Now, just a quick point. Saul is trying to do some things right. He's trying to still sort of see if he can stay in God's good graces. He expels all the people who practice the occult. He gets rid of all the mediums and spiritists from the land. We read on, it says this. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all Israel and set up camp at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, find me a woman who is a medium so I may go and inquire of her. Well, there is one in Endor, they said. Again, you got to understand the context. Saul is at war with the nation of the Philistines. The Philistines gather on one side of the valley. The nation of Israel gathers on the other. And as Saul looks out across the valley, sees the nation of the Philistines, sees their armies, all the military might, he is terrified. The Bible says that his heart is full of terror. He says, what am I going to do? He knows he has God's judgment pronounced on him. He knows that the time of the ending of his kingdom is close. What am I going to do? So he prays. And when he prays to God, what he hears is nothing. Now, I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I don't know if you've ever prayed and said, God, I really need to hear you. God, I really need to know direction. And your prayers have literally bounced off the ceiling. Saul prays, hears nothing. Then he ends up using some uh, like dice-like tools, spiritual things, and, and sees nothing in that. Then he goes to the prophets, the various people who inquire of God. He asks them, what are you hearing from God? What are you sensing? And they hear nothing. What do you do in your life 
when the silence of God is deafening? What do you do when you desperately and deeply need to know that God is with you in your life, but you hear nothing from him? Well, sadly, what Saul did is instead of leaning closer into God and seeking God's face, he ends up going a radically different direction. And he asked his attendants, would you find me a medium? Find me a witch. Now, here's the deal. Just quick, a little aside. Remember Saul had expelled all the mediums and spiritists from the land? But when he asked his attendants, can you find me a witch? Can you find me a medium? Isn't it interesting that they knew exactly where to find one? Here's my little notion here. If you're looking for trouble, you can always find it. If you're looking for trouble, you can always find it. Well, the story goes on in verse 8. Here's what he says. Saul disguised himself. He put on other clothes, and at night he and the two men went to the woman. Consult a spirit for me, he said, and bring up for me the one I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know that Saul, what Saul has done. He's cut out the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life to bring about my death? Saul swore to her by the Lord, as surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. I think there's a little game playing going on here. This witch, this medium, she knows exactly who Saul is. Scriptures tell us that Saul was taller than other Israelites. His face was clearly well known. He only just put on outer garments to get out of the palace. So I think she knew exactly who she was dealing with. But there's this little game playing here. You know, hey, this is illegal. We can't do this. And and Saul promises that she'll be safe. Well, now the story gets really dicey. So hang on, put your seatbelts up, tray tables up, and here we go. Then the woman said, what shall, who shall I bring up for you? Bring up Samuel, he said. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice and said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up. Then Saul knew that it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I am in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. So I have called on you to tell me what to do. Again, let me kind of walk through the context. There are three big difficulties in this particular session, which is why Pastor Lance asked me to preach on this topic and why I believe he should pay for the next lunch. Uh, Here's the first difficulty. This whole idea of a medium or a spiritist, a witch, does she really have spiritual power? Here's my answer to that. Absolutely. The Bible teaches unequivocally and clearly that there's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light. There are demonic beings who serve the kingdom of darkness and there are angelic beings who serve the kingdom of light. And I believe that there are medium spiritists, witches, who have the ability, as it were, to call upon evil forces, destructive demonic presences. And I believe she had the ability to create a destructive evil experience. Paul was going to consult her, even though that was clearly against God's law that had been established, even it was against his own law in the nation of Israel. So I do believe there are real destructive negative powers. Here's the second one. What happens to people when they die? Could this medium actually call up a departed spirit? Well, in order to answer that, I've got to quickly say to you that there's a difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let me tell you what the New Testament teaches. The New Testament teaches, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I believe the moment that we die, if you're a follower of Christ, your spirit goes immediately to be in the presence of the Lord. But in the Old Testament, there's also a clear teaching called Sheol, the resting place of the dead. It appears that the souls of those who are righteous and those who are unrighteous would kind of go to, as it were, sort of a resting place uh, until the time of Christ. And so what happens is I believe there really were people who could be called back from the dead. Now, here's the most controversial issue in the whole passage. Was this really Samuel that came up? Some commentators, it's kind of evenly divided. I consulted about 10 commentaries. Some commentaries say, no, 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 it wasn't Samuel. It was a demonic spirit that came up impersonating Samuel. Now, I land on the other side. And again, this is debatable. Commentators disagree on that. I land on the other side. I think this passage is actually showing us a a Samuel who is allowed by God to come back from Sheol, the resting place of the dead, to speak a word to Saul. Because I believe that God is allowing him to pronounce judgment again. 
I think you'll get that when you come to this next section. Let's read in verse 16, and that'll be the last section of this chapter that we'll read. It's not the end of the sermon, though. So, starting with verse 16. Samuel said, this is the, in, the, in the vision or in the dream that he's seeing, Why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has turned the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. I think that means that they're going to lose their life. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Now, one of the reasons I believe this really was Samuel coming to speak to Saul and proclaim judgment is that no demon would give that word in alignment with the will of God and the express judgment of God. So that's why I lean towards it really was Samuel that God had allowed to appear and speak to Saul. But let me interpret this Bible passage. Sometimes Bible passages are really hard to understand, but let me interpret this one. Samuel appears to Saul, looks at him as it were, and says, dude, you are toast. The reality is, is that you're going to lose your life, your boys are going to die, and the whole nation of Israel is going to be in captivity from the Philistines. This is not good news for Saul. In fact, the Bible records at the end of first chapter, or chapter 28, that he gets in the fetal position. He's literally paralyzed by bad news. He's so paralyzed he can't eat or take nourishment. The chapter closes with the witch actually feeding him a small meal. And you'll again read in chapters 29 through 31 what happens with the rest of the story. Well, here's the question I want to ask for today as you're in this year of worship. As you think about what is it that sometimes has my worship be cold? What is it sometimes that leaves my heart hard? And why do my prayers sometimes go unanswered? I believe that sometimes when we reach the dead end of our life, instead of going towards God, we go away from God. Instead of heeding the no trespassing sign, we just blow right past it. So you have teaching notes today. I want to give you three fill in the blanks, three words. The first word is the word sin. Maybe you're here today and you say, look, my prayers are not being answered. My worship just feels cold. My heart feels hard to the things of God. Why is that so? Well, sin could be the reason. Now, I know that's not a popular word. A lot of times people say, well, sin, that's kind of passe. We, we know enough about things uh, not to cause a guilt complex. Well, I'll just tell you this. God's truth is timeless and eternal. It doesn't matter if it's popular or not. Sin is missing the mark. It's rebellion against God. And sometimes we're in direct disobedience to God. And when we're in disobedience to God, we can't be in alignment with God. He can't answer our prayers. Our worship is cold and our hearts are hardened because we're in sin. This was Saul's case. God had pronounced judgment upon Saul. And because of that judgment on Saul, there was no way that Saul could experience anything but a dead end. He was at the end of his road and the end of his rope. Now, write the second word in. It's the word uh, wrong motives. Wrong motives. Sin separates us from God. Wrong motives is sometimes the reason we don't get the answer to our prayers. Sometimes we pray looking for things that are literally not in alignment with God's will. The book of James tells us that sometimes the reason we don't get an answer to prayer is we have wrong motives. Maybe you've never done this, but I have. I've opened my Bible to search God's word to get the answer that I wanted. In other words, I haven't been reading the Bible to find out what God wants to say to me. I've been reading the Bible to get confirmation of what I knew in my heart I already wanted to do. Is there no one else who's ever done that? I mean, I, literally, I, I sometimes will go, God, I really want to do this. God, just teach me your word. But the truth is, I already know good and well what I want to do. Sometimes I pray and I already have my plan. And I'm just asking for God's sanction of the plan that I've already established. Truthfully, I don't really want to, God to tell me what he wants to do. I want to know what it is that I want to do, and therefore I just want his confirmation of that. So sometimes the reason we're at a dead end, the end of the road, the end of our rope, is because we don't only have sin in our life, sometimes we have wrong motives. Here's the third word I want you to write down. That's the word unbelief. Sometimes the reason why God can't honor us, he can't bless us, is we're in a position of unbelief. And maybe you're here today. And you say, look, I'm not real sure where all this God stuff goes. I'm not really sure where I stand with God in my life. I don't know exactly what I think about him. But the truth is, is that I just don't believe. I don't have a relationship with God. If you don't have a relationship with God here this morning, then you're in a place where God can't honor you. He can't favor you. He can't bless you. You're not in alignment with his purposes. Those are three reasons why you could reach the end of the road and end of your rope. And maybe that's where you are today. But I suspect for some of us in this room, 
It's not because of a direct sin that we're aware of. It's not because uh, any mixed motives. It's not because of any unbelief. But there's another reason that we're at the end of the road and end of our rope. And that is what I call a tsunami of circumstances. A tsunami of circumstances has begun to crush us. You didn't ask for the relational break that you're experiencing right now. You didn't ask for the financial catastrophe that you're laboring under right now. You didn't ask for the medical diagnosis that you just received. The truth is, is that there's a tsunami of circumstances that has overwhelmed you and you are at the end of the road, end of the rope, and you just don't know where is God in the midst of all this. Again, pastorally speaking, I believe we have a choice. When we reach the end of a road, end of our rope, we've got a choice to either cry out and call out for God and lean into him or lean away from him. So what do you do when you're at the end of the road? What do you do when you're at the end of your rope? Guys, you're going to like this. I did some historical research. And guys, you know, sometimes we get nailed a lot for like not willing to ask directions, right? So I did a little historical research on this. It's apparently genetically uh, imprinted upon to us. Uh, Daniel Boone, great explorer, great uh, frontiersman, uh, knew how to navigate his way through seemingly uh, a dense forest and that sort of stuff. Somebody asked Daniel Boone one time, he said, Daniel, uh, have you ever been lost in the woods? And Daniel had a great answer. He said, no, I... No, nope, I've never been lost. He said, but I was mighty perplexed for a couple days once. <laughs> so guys, next time you think you're lost, you're not lost, you're just a little perplexed, okay? So I was thinking about that. What do you do when you reach the end of the road and you feel lost, you don't know where to go, you're at the end of your rope? And I came across this passage and you've probably heard it before, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says this, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. First time I read that, by the way, I, I did some research and I found out that that whole phrase, jars of clay, actually means, some translations call it uh, earthen vessels. But if you dig a little bit deeper, that jars of clay, earthen vessels, actually means cracked pots. And I thought, how is it that God could put his treasure, his good news of his love and kindness, his forgiveness, his mercy, how could he put that in cracked pots? But the more I thought about it and reflected on it, it just makes perfect sense. God puts heavenly treasure, God puts his goodness, his kindness in cracked pots, in imperfect vessels like me and like you so that we can leak all over the place with his love and kindness and gentleness. So maybe you're at the end of the road today. Maybe you're at the end of your rope and you're wondering what to do and it's not been disobedience specifically. It's not been wrong motives. It's, it's not been unbelief, but it's just a tsunami of circumstances that threaten to crush you. What do you do? I want to challenge you to lean into God and hear these words as a cracked pot that contains heavenly treasure. We are hard pressed on every side, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but not destroyed. Failure and dead ends are not fatal and they're not final as long as you lean into God instead of away from him. Again, some examples from history. In 1902, the poetry editor of the Atlantic Monthly returned a sheaf of poems to a 28-year-old poet with this short note. Quote, our magazine has no room for your vigorous verse. That poet was Robert Frost and he rejected the rejection. Now, I had heard that story, but I had not previously heard this one. In 1905, the University of Bern turned down a PhD dissertation as being irrelevant and fanciful. The young physics student who wrote that dissertation was Albert Einstein, and he rejected that rejection. In 1894, the rhetoric teacher at Harrow in England wrote on the 16-year-old's report card a quote, and I quote, a conspicuous lack of success. That 16-year-old was Winston Churchill. Sports fans in here will know that Michael Jordan was cut from his high school basketball team. What do you do when you've reached the end of your road? You've reached the end of your rope. Well, the reality is, is there has to be something that God has for us. Galatians 6, 9 says this, don't get weary in well-doing. Eventually, we'll reap a harvest if we don't give up in due time. Well, I told you a little bit of my story earlier. Let me kind of complete uh, that so you get a, a more full and, and complete picture. I grew up in church, as I said, and I had people patting me on the head. My dad was a pastor. Mom and dad pastored small Baptist churches. I had people pat me on the head and say, you're going to be a pastor just like your dad when you grow up. 
And I would grit my teeth as a young boy and say, not if I can help it. I wanted to be a pro baseball player. I was a really good shortstop, pretty good hitter. And I said, I want to be a pro baseball player. But I was a firstborn and pretty analytic as well. And I got to age 15, about the end of my 15th year. And I figured out, you know what? I'm good, but I'm not great. And I had kind of this life crisis and figured out what is it that I'm going to do. And so I remember praying to God. I had a good relationship with God. I prayed to God. I said, God, what would you have me do with my life? God, I want to serve you. I want to be faithful. I'll do anything you ask me to do, God. I'll do anything. There's just two things that I will never do, God. Number one, I said, God, I will never be a missionary. Growing up in church, I knew all about missionaries. Missionaries wear grass skirts. They live in grass huts. They show boring slideshows when they come back to America. (laughs) And I said, no way, absolutely not. I am not going to be a missionary. Then I said, the second thing, God, I will never, ever do is I will never be a pastor. Because I grew up in church. I'd seen the underbelly. I mean, church is made up of messed up people like me and like you, right? So I just said, forget it. God will do anything. So one night I was in church, 16 years of age, and my dad was preaching. I don't remember a word he said, but I felt like God spoke to me. I had an amazing encounter. I didn't hear a Charlton Heston-like voice, but I did hear God speak to me. I want you to serve me full-time with your life as a pastor. Man, it was a small little Baptist church. We got to the end. We did the thing called the invitation. Some of you know about this. And it was about the 18th verse of Just As I Am, where I walked down the aisle. Some of you have been in that church. And so I walked down the aisle. I said, hey, Dad, uh, God has called me to be a pastor. And the whole church erupted in cheers. They were excited and ecstatic and all that. And I was totally depressed. (laughs) And I don't know if you've ever seen a teenager with an attitude, but I was that teenager, okay? So I'm there and I'm depressed. And here's why I was depressed. I knew exactly what my life was going to be. I was going to go to Bible college and seminary. And then I was going to go preach to 25 people and some sheep in South Dakota. I just, I I knew that that was what my life was going to be. Some people describe that as that's the kind of place where you marry and bury or you you hatch, match, and dispatch. You're you're there at the birth, you're there at the wedding, you're there at the funeral. I just knew my life was over. Now, my dad uh, is now with the Lord. He died many years ago. But I want to tell you this. uh, My dad had a lot of faults. I could probably tell you a few pages full of faults of my dad. He wasn't perfect. He was a pastor. He was messed up like we all are and... But can I just give you one memory from my childhood growing up? I was a fairly light sleeper. I I remember many, many times, hundreds of times, I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of times where I would kind of roll over in the middle of the night, maybe midnight, one o'clock in the morning, and and I'd roll, I'd sense a presence in the room. And and, and eventually I'd sort of like come to semi-consciousness, and I know that presence was someone there. And as I remember kind of many, many, many times waking up from that sleep, I would look down to the foot of my bed, and there would be my father kneeling and placing his hand on my bed and praying over me while I slept. I had a messed up dad. Messed up just like me. But I had a parent who prayed over me. And my father and mother provided that kind of legacy with all the faults and failings they had. They provided that kind of legacy for me. So my wife and I uh, ended up having a bunch of kids. We had uh, the girls uh, first and we had the boys. And as young parents, we, we knew we were making mistakes. We knew we weren't going to get stuff right. We were going to fall short and all that. And so we kept asking each other, what can we give to our kids? We certainly couldn't give them perfect parents. We certainly couldn't give them everything they wanted. What can we give our kids? And so one thing we came upon is that no matter how many other ways we fail, and we knew we were going to fail a lot, we can pray for our children. We can surround them and cover them with prayer. And then we did a little study and we found out this concept of blessing, that we could speak blessing into their lives. We could make a choice to speak life to them, not death. We could speak to them in spite of all of our failures and all the ways that we were going to mess up and fall short. We could say to them that they had a father who loved them, a father who was perfect, not me, but their heavenly father, one who would be with them, who had a future and a hope for them. And we would speak that into their life. And so we've messed up a ton of times with our kids, but I can tell you this, we've been faithful in prayer. We've spoken blessing into their lives. So here's what I'd like to do for you this morning. I don't know your story. I really don't. I don't know if you're at the end of the road or the end of your rope. I don't, I don't know if it's a tsunami of circumstances or if it's, if it's uh, sin or rebellion or mixed motives or unbelief. But if you're at the end of your road, if you're at the end of your rope, I want to pray for you this morning. I want to speak blessing in your life. In just a few moments, I'm going to read some affirmations over you. And as I do that, I just want you to receive these from the hand of your Heavenly Father. They're not from me. These are declarations from Scripture. Later on, they'll be posted on the website. You can get access to these. Would you close your eyes? 
As you close your eyes, I'm very aware that some may be here today who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If that's the case in your life, and you don't know him as Savior, you don't have a relationship with him, I'd love to talk to you afterwards at the WJU table. Or maybe uh, you're here today and say, look, I know Christ, but uh, I just am in this season of maybe disobedience or struggling with my motives or, or that sort of thing, or maybe just a tsunami of circumstance. As you close your eyes, let me pray these things over you and have you press into God, not away from him. I am fully forgiven and free from all shame and condemnation. I act in audacious faith to change the world in my generation. I have no fear or anxiety. I trust in the Lord with all my heart. I am able to fulfill the calling that God has placed in my life. I am fully resourced to do everything that God has called me to do. I have no insecurity because I see myself the way God sees me. I am a faithful spouse, and if you're single, maybe you can slip in future in there, and a godly parent. Our family is blessed. I am completely whole, physically, mentally, and emotionally. I'm increasing in influence and favor for the kingdom of God. I am enabled to walk in the sacrificial love of Christ. I have the wisdom of the Lord concerning every decision I make, and I am protected from all harm and evil in Jesus' name. With your eyes still closed, Father, I pray this morning that the good men and women, the young men and young women, the boys and girls of Bridgeway Christian Church, that they would experience your tender touch right now. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you would touch men and women at their point of need. There are some here today who do not know you as Savior, and they wonder what it's like to actually have a relationship with a Heavenly Father, to have a relationship with a God who is perfect, to have a relationship with the one who created heaven and earth, but loves them. God, I pray that your spirit would press into them right now. Some here in this room would say, I'm living in a season of rebellion, of sin. My motives I'm struggling with. Still others would say, I'm almost crushed by a tsunami of circumstances. God, I pray that you would come right now. And instead of leaning away from you, we would lean into you. We'd press into you. Your word tells us that if any of us lack wisdom, let them ask of you and it will be given. Your word tells us that the prayers of the saints are like incense ascending to your throne. Oh God, I pray that you would hear our cry, hear our prayer. I ask, Lord, that we would press into you, that the men and women of this church would be blessed, the young men and the young women would be blessed, that the young boys and girls would be blessed, not by perfect parents, not by perfect marriages, but by marriages and parenting and individuals, men and women who press into you and sense your touch. Oh God. I pray that the abundant fruit of this ministry would continue, that your hand would be upon this place, and through the power of your Spirit, you might lead each and every one of us to right relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. And it's now in his name, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, Almighty God, in the name of Jesus, that we ask these things. And all God's people said... Amen. God bless you.